the classic megalithic monument in the south of England. Completed 4,000 years ago, it remains impressive to this day. But Stonehenge is just one of many hundreds of megalithic structures built in Western Europe between 5000 and 2000 BC. The most ambitious by sheer amount of stone are the megalithic alignments of Karnak, a seaside town in Brittany, the western peninsula of France. The alignments consist of several parallel stone rows extending over two miles in total. What we see now may be as little as a tenth of the original, the stones having been plundered for Roman roads and medieval churches. These alignments raise the question of what they are aligned with. Traditional interpretations of the alignments have looked for astronomical significance, seeing them as pointing towards the sun, moon or even a star at a particular time on a particular day. But what if their significance is geographical and they actually point towards something on the ground? What lies in the path of the Karnak alignments? If we follow the line of the stones, it takes us out across the Atlantic Ocean and eventually hits the coast of Brazil. But not just anywhere in Brazil, the Karnak megaliths point precisely to the mouth of the Amazon River. Coincidence? It would seem like it. The Karnak alignments were constructed long before Columbus initiated the European discovery of America. Yet let's not be too hasty. The Karnak alignments, like Stonehenge, were built during the Bronze Age, and in the 1990s the South African writer Jim Bailey argued that Bronze Age voyagers travelled from Europe to America to obtain the copper and tin needed for making bronze. Professional archaeologists dismissed him as a crank, but Bailey's point was that we routinely underestimate the people of the past. Bronze swords were far superior to Stone Age weaponry. It was a case of either get bronze or become slaves to those people who did have it. The pressure to get bronze was immense. But copper and tin, the ingredients of bronze, are quite rare. Finding them in the same place is even rarer. Yet that was the ideal because bronze could then be made on the spot, minimising the transport of raw materials. One of the few places on earth where copper and tin occur together is in the upper reaches of the Amazon basin. Given the huge appetite for bronze, Bronze Age merchants can be expected to have undertaken long and daring voyages in search of the vital metals. If we look at where the earliest megalithic structures are found, it is on the western fringes of Spain, France and the British Isles. What connects these areas is the sea. Later the megalith builders spread to the Mediterranean and the Baltic. We are looking at a civilization that was focused on the ocean, that was at home in the ocean, and that travelled by ship rather than overland. For such a seagoing people, the journey to South America was by no means unthinkable, being only twice the distance from one end of their domain to the other. If these people traded in American bronze, it would explain how they could afford to build these extraordinary megalithic monuments. Jim Bailey suggested it might also explain why Stonehenge and other stone circles were aligned to astronomical events like the summer solstice. Land-based farmers do not need that kind of accuracy to know when to plant and harvest their crops. But for mariners who navigate by the stars, that kind of accuracy is crucially important. Their impurities give metals a fingerprint that can show where they were mined, and no ancient bronze has been linked to South America. However, in many cases the source has yet to be identified, so America cannot be ruled out. For example, it used to be thought the Bronze Age civilization of Crete got its copper from Cyprus. But this has been shown to be incorrect, so the source of Crete's copper remains a mystery. Archaeologists also now recognise that the modern Amazon jungle grew up after Columbus when the Americas were depopulated by violence and disease. Where there is now forest, there were once the towns and villages of a flourishing civilization. It is not impossible that these vanished people participated in a transatlantic bronze trade. But if people were travelling to America in the Bronze Age, why was it unknown in Columbus's day? Bailey pointed out that the transition from Bronze Age to Iron Age was very traumatic. Unlike copper and tin, iron is widespread. 
It is found everywhere. Once people had learned how to smelt iron, the societies that had grown rich on bronze or grown powerful through the use of bronze weapons were in trouble. But they were not going to give up their privileges without a fight. With the coming of iron, the world descended into a terrible dark age. The economy based around bronze collapsed. The bronze-based political order also collapsed in a world now awash with iron weaponry. The seagoing societies of Western Europe lost their bronze trade income and stopped building megalithic monuments. By the time the world found a new equilibrium, centuries had gone by. The Americas had been forgotten. The centres of power and wealth had shifted. With civilization now based around iron, the incentives for long-distance voyaging had also disappeared. But myth and legend retained a distant memory. One of Hercules' twelve labours was to fetch the golden apples of the Hesperides. The Hesperides means lands of the setting sun, a poetic term for the far west. The golden apples may be the bronze ingots that once came from there. And notice the word atl, which appears in Atlantic, and in Quetzalcoatl, the white bearded demigod of Central America who came from and returned to the east. On one side of this ocean are Africa's Atlas Mountains, and on the other, the Andes. Atlantis, does this ring any bells? If Bailey is right, the fact the Karnak alignments point towards the Amazon looks like more than coincidence. In the Pacific, traditional Polynesian navigators take back sights on the land as they leave port, lining up two landmarks to hold the desired course. Could the Karnak alignments have served as such back sights, helping sailors set off in the right direction? True, you only need two landmarks for an effective back sight. All the other stones look like wasted effort. But people routinely over-elaborate things that are important to them, like the medieval cathedrals. A bigger problem is that the stones are largely hidden from the sea by high ground, and they are not even straight, but have a definite kink. Given this, today's Karnak alignments were probably not navigational aids and had some ceremonial purpose, but they could have picked up their general orientation from the actual navigational aids built nearby and pointing the way across the Atlantic. Recent research in the Gulf of Morbihan the sea area to the south of Karnak, hints at the existence of lost megaliths hidden beneath the waves by rising sea levels. Perhaps here may be found the original alignments, whose purpose 5,000 years ago was to help Bronze Age sailors steer a course for the Amazon and its supplies of copper and tin.